Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the webinar, The Evolution of Portfolio Construction and Real Assets. My name is Howard Omdahl, and I'm your wholesaler for Nine Point Partners based in Winnipeg. My business partner, Dan DeCruz, is also on the line in Toronto with our featured speaker, Jeff Sayer, Portfolio Manager of the Nine Point Global Real Estate and Global Infrastructure Funds. In the institutional investment community in Canada, a revolution in asset allocation and portfolio construction has been underway for at least the last 15 years. Led by the likes of OMERS and the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, alternative investments have been introduced alongside traditional fixed income and equity allocations. The definition can vary, but generally alternative investments have been focused on four asset classes, real estate, infrastructure, private equity, and private debt. One of the focuses of Nine Point Partners is private debt, but our emphasis, our emphasis today will be on global real estate and global infrastructure. Jeff is going to talk about how we got here in terms of the evolution of portfolio construction, why it makes sense for a retail investor's portfolio to include alternative investments, and conclude by highlighting two of the funds that he manages, both of which have consistently ranked near the top of their peer groups. I've asked, I have some questions previously submitted by advisors and a couple of my own. If you'd like to ask, ask Jeff a question, please email me at halmdal at ninepoint.com during the webinar and I'll put the questions to Jeff. And now Jeff, over to you. Thanks Howard and welcome to the webinar everyone. My name is Jeff Sayer. I'm the portfolio manager of the real asset strategies at Nine Point Partners, uh, including the Nine Point Global Real Estate Fund and the Nine Point Global Infrastructure Fund. Now, both mandates are reasonably similar in that they were designed to provide investors with stable monthly income and varying degrees of capital appreciation throughout the cycle. In the current macroeconomic environment, characterized by relatively low growth and low interest rates, Uncorrelated dividend or income oriented strategies are, are ideally suited to help investors meet their total return expectations in the context of a diversified investment portfolio. So I'm going to cover several topics during the webinar today, uh, discuss the evolution of portfolio construction, provide a short macroeconomic update and conclude with an overview of each of my funds. Um, so let's start the webinar on uh, slide five. So here's our slide on the evolution of portfolio construction. It shows over time how portfolio construction has evolved. Uh, modern portfolio theory started uh, the trend. This is typically your traditional 60-40 equity to bonds portfolio. Um, we've moved on past that into the portfolio factoring model where investors could further differentiate uh, their portfolios based on asset classes underlying characteristics. So for example, you added value equities, you added growth equities, uh, you had sovereign bonds, you had uh, corporate bonds and high yield bonds uh, in the portfolios. And what that did was it increased the risk adjusted return of the overall portfolio. Uh, today, institutional investors are using the endowment model where they've broadened the investment universe and added a significant allocation to alternative investment classes or asset classes, which diversified the portfolio and optimized the expected return for a given level of risk. So in this chart, we're showing how uh, the various models actually perform historically. So the pie chart on the right shows what is a typical endowment model portfolio. You can see the nine point is offering the products on the right hand of the pie chart, including infrastructure and real estate. We also have private debt, private equity, uh, real asset strategies, including commodities. Um, so that's your, your typical endowment model portfolio. Now the chart on the left is showing the concept of the efficient frontier. And here what we're doing is we're showing the annualized return versus portfolio volatility under each of the three models we discussed on the previous slide. The lowest dot is actually the classic allocation. It's the traditional 60-40 portfolio. Uh, the teal dot in the middle there is the factored classic allocation. And the darker blue dot on the curve there is actually the endowment model. And so what you can see is as portfolio uh, construction evolved, what we were able to do is we were able to shift the curve up and to the left. And how you read that is, is that at any given level of risk, you have a greater expected annualized return, or for the same annualized expected return, you can actually lower your portfolio volatility. Uh, so the chart on page seven shows why this actually works. And so what it does is it requires the, the addition of uncorrelated asset classes to your portfolio. And so on the left, the bar charts, what we can see in that over time, 
uh, within the asset classes, correlations have actually increased. And so what this implies is that if you add additional managers within the same asset allocation, you don't get much of the benefits of diversification in your portfolio. Uh, essentially, if you're buying one U.S. equity manager, you're buying, you might as well be buying them all or buying the market. But what we can see on the graph on the right is that the real asset strategies have actually a much lower or even a negative correlation to traditional asset classes. And so when we calculate the correlation to say for Canadian equities, we see that real estate has a correlation of 0.48, infrastructure has a correlation of 0.25. And when we compare it to Canadian fixed income, real estate has a correlation of only 0.17 and infrastructure actually tends to be negatively correlated uh, with Canadian fixed income securities. And so that's why these, these asset classes provide you that real benefit of diversification. It has a much lower correlation than traditional asset classes. So on slide eight, uh, this demonstrates why Nine Point is actually uh, working towards adding these to your portfolio. Um, based on the data we've collected, typical retail investors are only about 5% allocated to alternative investments but the institutional uh, money managers, including pensions and endowments, have moved upwards of 50% of their portfolio to be these active uh, alternative investments. And so we think there's a tremendous amount of room for the average retail client to add these strategies to their portfolio and improve their overall expected risk return. So why Nine Point Partners? Just quickly, let me talk about Nine Point Partners. Uh, experienced portfolio manager. I've been managing the real asset strategies here at Nine Point since we brought them in-house in October 2016, both the real estate fund and the global infrastructure fund. As we've just discussed, the products offer portfolio diversification and help improve your overall risk-adjusted return. Uh, I follow a disciplined investment process. It's actively managed, it's repeatable, uh, and it's very disciplined. Uh, we can talk about the process a little bit uh, later on in the webinar. I do run concentrated portfolios uh, of high quality companies at attractive valuations. I'm not limited by geography, sector, or market capitalization. Uh, generally, I run around 25 to 35 names, so I make sure that my top ideas are well represented within the portfolio. The strategies I run do pay a consistent yield. Uh, both the Global Real Estate Fund and the Global Infrastructure Fund pay monthly distribution. It's targeted at 4.5% per annum annualized, uh, and it resets annually. So I'm going to give a quick macro up to, macroeconomic update just to, to lay the groundwork of where we are and where I think we're going here with the funds. I'm going to start it on slide 13 here, where we have the S&P 500 uh, graph that shows just how dramatic the correction was in late 2018 and how dramatic the recovery was actually in 2019. Um, that's your typical V bottom there. It's actually amazing to see on the chart. And what we do is when we overlay the forward price to earnings multiple, and that's the gray line. What we can see was that the correction and recovery was really related to sentiment. It's not as if we were seeing earnings estimates collapsing at that point, but it was a real fear that gripped the market and investors where the forward PE compressed from 17 times to 14 and then bounced back to 16. And from my perspective, the real driver of this correction and recovery was uh, the US Federal Reserve. So in late 18, they had a very hawkish bias. We were looking to hike rates several times and the market panicked over that. And so in 2019, very early in the year, they pivoted to dovishness uh, and the market was able to recover because we felt that the Fed was no longer gonna hike us into a recession. We've actually seen two interest rate cuts year to date, uh, both of 25 basis points each. And I'm expecting at least one more before year end going forward. So the real question is why haven't, hasn't the earnings multiple expanded back to the prior highs of 17 times or even higher? Uh, and for me, obviously the answer is the escalating US-China trade war. Uh, this has a, a real impact on uh, business confidence and it has a real impact on the multiples that investors are willing to pay looking forward. So what I've done is I've broken it down here on the, the three tranches of tariffs that Trump has introduced uh, against Chinese uh, imports. And we can see that the real concerns are really around the, the, the third and final tranche, especially tranche 3B that he's postponed until actually December 15th, 2019, because that is the final bucket of real consumer goods coming from China to the US. And that would be a, a much more severe um, tariff, punitive tariff than some of these other tariffs that we've seen in place. Now, recently we've seen some positive signs. We've seen some exemptions from the Chinese 
uh, on some of the goods coming from the U.S. into China. Uh, we've seen them agreeing to purchase some uh, agricultural products again from the United States. Uh, we do have them meeting early in October at very high level meetings. So I'm hopeful that we see, you know, not particularly even a, a, a real trade deal, but if we can just reach some sort of truce in terms of the trade negotiations, I think the market would still continue to respond very positively. So here I've laid out the range of potential scenarios based on 2020 expected earnings. Uh, and so you, using the consensus earnings estimates, we can see that the market is basically roughly fairly valued. And so I did these calculations at the end of August. The market's actually a little bit higher than here, but roughly in the range. And so at about 16 times forward earnings, a little bit of good news on trade and a little bit of confidence in the forward earnings, I think could allow the market to continue to rally from here. And you could get high single digit, even double digit returns from today's valuations. Conversely, I think if, if we did see that final tranche of tariffs go on and trade war really escalate, it would not be surprising to see some downside uh, in the market from here. But uh, I, I'm confident that Trump wants to get reelected. So I think we're going to see some positive news over the coming months. This chart here is the U.S. 10-year Treasury bond yield, which fell as low as 1.4% early September, bounced back to 1.9, is now declining again below the 1.8 level. We're at about a 1.65% uh, yield today. This is where the real fear exists, right? It, you know, investors are really pricing in in the bond market a recessionary scenario. And so the question is, is where can investors go for yield in this environment? Where, where can we pick up any sort of return if you have an income oriented uh, client? Um, and so for us, obviously, we think the real asset strategies can meet that need uh, going forward. So how do we position our portfolios in this environment? Obviously, my view is actively managed alternative asset classes. You want funds with the greatest flexibility to differentiate relative to the benchmark. Uh, we want quality assets, companies that attract valuations. Uh, I think certainly think that dividends are likely to become a greater component of your total return going forward. And you want someone who employs a consistent disciplined investment process. You have to ignore the noise. You have to maintain your confidence in your investment strategy uh, to generate those returns over time. Just as a final thought on the macro, um, the underlying global fundamentals are actually still positive. They're not indicative of an imminent recession. Uh, global GDP forecasts remain solid. The IMS is calling for 3.2% in 2019, 3.5% in 2020. The global PMI reading remains positive. The most recent reading of the JP Morgan Global Composite PMI is 51.3 in August, well above the 50.0 line that indicates contraction or expansion. Importantly, the U.S. consumer, which is 70% of U.S. GDP, is in fantastic shape. U.S. unemployment rates near 50-year lows. Consumer confidence is near 20-year highs. Uh, and the Fed is cutting rates to stimulate the economy. So we've already seen two cuts this year. Uh, at the end of August, the U.S. federal funds futures were pricing in an additional 50 basis points of easing by year end. We've already seen one of those cuts. So I'm still expecting another 25 basis points of easing either October or December of this year. Um, the one caveat I would point to is that the U.S. two-year, 10-year yield curve did briefly invert. Now, this is a leading indicator that has had a very good track record of predicting economic downturn, but it's within one to two years out. Uh, and this has always worked in a normal interest rate and inflationary environment. And so I'm not really sure that we are in a normal interest rate and inflation environment, considering that so much of the debt globally or sovereign debt globally is either yielding zero or negative rates. So I think it's a very unusual interest rate environment right now. So I'm not sure how reliable that signal is uh, from the yield curve today. So quickly, I want to talk about my investment process that I apply both to the real estate uh, fund and the infrastructure fund. Um, I am a process driven investor. It's a quality value approach. And so the first step is identifying the investable universe for each mandate. Uh, and so basically we're using our benchmarks that we track our funds against to, to identify our, our investable universe. I then employ a disciplined scoring and ranking system. And I'm using slightly different metrics for the, for the two funds. So I'm using price to funds from operations to growth plus yield for real estate and PE to growth plus yield for the global infrastructure fund. The next step is to conduct the fundamental analysis on each individual security. Uh, that's what I've done all my careers, crunch numbers on the stocks and, and try and find the names that I think are gonna outperform. Uh, you then construct a diversified but concentrated portfolio. 
Again, I, I run portfolios with 25 to 35 stocks. I like having my best ideas well represented within the portfolio. Um, and I do take a total return approach. So I am cognizant that total returns, both capital appreciation and yield. And so I'm looking for companies that are growing, say, 8 to 10%, paying a 2 to 4% dividend yield, which gives you about a total return algorithm of about 12%. So that's my, my targeted hurdle rate for an investment. The cell discipline is also very important because we do run concentrated portfolios. And so I use a fundamental and technicals approach to decide when to sell an individual investment. Uh, things like failure to meet expectations when management uh, misses earnings estimates or, or fails to deliver on something they've promised us, that's a clear red flag. Weakening fundamentals are also very concerning. So again, our fundamental analysis on things like margins, revenue growth, cash flow conversion, uh, leverage metrics, payout ratios, all that, all that type of number crunching we do to decide whether or not the fundamentals are moving in the right direction. A change in corporate strategy is also something that we take a hard look at. If we see a business leveraging up to buy something or become involved in something that isn't typically known as one of their core competencies, it's concern. And finally, I do use a little bit of technicals uh, to decide when to get out of a position. Uh, what I find is that when you're running a concentrated portfolio, you can't allow a position to get too far away from you uh, if it's not performing well. And so if it's starting to break through moving average lines or underperforming on a relative strength basis, I want to replace it with my next best idea. And because we run a, a, a tight portfolio here, uh, I think that's the best way of growing value over time. So let's talk about global real estate investing briefly. So. I think most investors would understand the characteristics that make real estate a very attractive asset class. It really is that consistent, stable yield uh, throughout the business cycle. It has a steady, predictable income stream that they pay to the, the end investor. There is some Mars capital appreciation potential as well, where the companies are growing their net asset value or their cash flows. Uh, it does give you that hard asset protection uh, against rising inflation and interest rates. And again, it does provide you with that portfolio diversification because it has that lower correlation to the other asset classes. Um, the sector itself or the asset class itself has been experiencing positive funds flows driven by institutional money managers and retail investors. And I think one of the important stats there is that the reporting members of the Pension Investment Association of Canada have a real estate weight of approximately 12.8% of total assets. Uh, so if the average retail client is only about 5% of the real asset strategies, uh, or alternative investments, I think there's plenty of room to, to move their allocations higher. Uh, traditional real estate, uh, we do buy publicly traded REITs. Uh, as most investors know, they pay out the majority of their earnings in the tax advantage structure. The distributions are based on cash flow, not on reported earnings. I'm buying investment grade commercial real estate, core markets, key locations. We're not buying distressed properties. We're not looking for turnaround situations. We're not looking for over leveraged stuff that's deleveraging or high payout ratios. We're, we're buying core stuff here. Um, we want to see funds from operations and adjusted funds from operations growth. And the various ways that management teams can do that are through contractual rent increases, improving occupancy levels, lease renewals, accretive acquisitions, development and debt refinancing. So here are the real estate subsectors based on our benchmark below. 10% uh, weight ones are retail REITs, office and residential REITs. Uh, we're going to talk about how we're different, how we have a different product than most of our peers, uh, but we are very different from our benchmark. We'll talk about that in a second. So what we've done differently is I've taken a total real estate approach. And what I've done is I've broadened the definition uh, to emphasize and include businesses that share similar attributes as traditional real estate assets, but are slightly different, but still have an attractive expected return profile. And so what I've really focused the portfolio on or, or work on are technology and media campuses, communication networks, distribution and logistics centers, life science clusters and healthcare facilities in the office space that we depend upon in a modern developed economy. Now these have tremendous uh, barriers to entry, large capital costs, uh, but widespread adoption across an existing user base. Um, so for example, you know, myself and a few other investors, we could pool our funds, leverage up, we could buy a, a small strip mall or a low rise apartment building, but we simply cannot go out and build our own data center network or cell phone tower network. And that's what I think makes those uh, asset classes uh, very unique. Um, these businesses tend to have a lower absolute dividend yield, but higher growth and therefore greater capital appreciation potential. And so some of the um, total real estate investments that I've added to the portfolio include wireless communication towers, data centers, the tech campuses, 
distribution logistics centers to take advantage of the e-commerce, uh, the growth in e-commerce, life science clusters, and healthcare facilities. So let's talk about the fund specifically here. Uh, slide 29, you can see some of the fund details, uh, sector allocation, geographic allocations, and top tens. Uh, from a sector allocation, you can see that we are overweight the industrial REITs, uh, we're overweight the residential REITs because I'm bullish on housing as well, and we're overweight the specialized REITs, uh, which again are the data centers and cell phone towers. We're very underweight retail, uh, which has served us nicely through uh, the past several years here as, as fears of e-commerce have really pressured traditional retail mall and strip uh, REITs. Uh, geographic allocations are about 70% in the U.S., higher than the benchmark, but from our work in modeling and scoring and ranking, still the most attractive uh, region of the world to buy uh, REITs. Top 10 positions, uh, data centers and infrastructure assets, such as uh, cell phone towers are well represented, uh, as well as some residential REITs. Um, total names in the portfolio are 27, so it is a concentrated book. And over the past year, 20 of those names have increased their distribution with an average dividend increase of 12.9%. So these names are actually growing their distributions. I don't want something with a high payout or high absolute dividend yield. We're looking for guys who can continue to grow their distribution over time. Uh, slide 31 is the performance of the nine point global real estate fund over time. Uh, the fund's inception is in 2015. It was basically an index fund. We took it over in October 2016. And so you can see that we've had very good performance relative uh, to the, to the benchmark over time. Uh, we've been running the fund for about three years, so you can see our three-year number relative uh, to the benchmark. It's very good performance, so I'm very, very pleased with uh, how the fund has been performing, how our strategy has been working. Slide 32 actually shows our actual performance since we brought the fund in-house, so stripping out when it was managed under another sub-advisor agreement. And you can see that most of our peers are tracking almost precisely the benchmark, but we're well ahead of both the peers and the benchmark since we took the fund in-house. So again, it really validates what we've been doing. It validates our differentiated approach to real estate investing. Uh, you can see our year-to-date numbers. We have a very nice spread over our benchmark uh, that's working quite nicely. So we can now talk about global infrastructure investing. So again, uh, unique characteristics that are suited to the needs of an income-oriented investor, so very similar to the real estate space. It's those consistent, stable cash flows through the business cycle, a steady, predictable income stream with modest capital appreciation potential. Again, you have that hard asset protection against rising inflation and interest rates, uh, and it does give you that portfolio diversification due to the low correlation with other assets. Again, this is an asset class where institutional and some retail investors have been increasing their allocations. I certainly think valuations have benefited from those uh, capital flows. And again, the reporting members of the Pension Investment Association of Canada have an infrastructure weight of approximately 8.2% of total assets. So if you combine uh, real estate and infrastructure weightings, it's about a 20% allocation to the real asset strategies under the endowment model. Traditional infrastructure, and uh, I've included the, the definition because I like how it sounds here. It's the essential facilities and services that drive the economic productivity of a developed or developing society. Uh, so think assets with high initial capital costs but low annual maintenance capex, regulated long-term contracts or GDP-linked revenue with a monopoly or near monopoly market position. You service a large group of end users through irreplaceable hard assets. And so below you can see the sectors where traditional infrastructure assets can be found. And this is based on our benchmark again. So the utilities are about a 45% weight, industrial is 27, energy is 15, real estate about 13%. Um, we have a different approach. We're not benchmark uh, based investors. So we're gonna describe our process here. So again, what we've taken is a total infrastructure approach. And we've brought in the definition to include businesses that share similar attributes as traditional infrastructure assets. Again, a different but still attractive expected return profile. So I've included technology, communication, logistics, and financial networks that we depend upon every day to function in a developed economy and really in a modern digital economy as well. So even, even more relevant uh, types of infrastructure assets. Again, significant barriers to, of entry due to prohibitive capital costs or widespread adoption across an existing user base. Irreplaceable assets or intellectual property rights. 
And again, these have generally a lower dividend yield, but higher growth and therefore ca greater capital appreciation potential. So some of the examples of assets that I think fall under a total infrastructure approach include high-speed internet providers, because I think the internet is a form of infrastructure, software platforms and data centers. And again, what we're trying to take advantage of is the growth in cloud computing, distribution logistics centers to take advantage of the trend towards e-commerce, financial payment networks and stock exchanges. And so you think when you tap your Visa card, it really is as if it's a toll road on a, a financial transaction. So we like those assets. And I've also included things like aerospace and defense uh in the infrastructure fund because i think uh, defense is is a real type of infrastructure that a modern economy depends upon on the fund specifically the nine point global infrastructure fund uh, again our fund details on slide 39 uh, we have our sector allocations or geographic allocations in our top 10 equity positions what you can see is we're underweight the traditional infrastructure categories are underweight utilities, are underweight industrials, are underweight energy, but we've been able to add those non-traditional or total infrastructure investments to the portfolio, things like in the communication sector, in the financial sector, uh, infotech would be our data centers here and payment networks. Uh, we are overweight industrial REITs as well, uh, but we do have a significant underweight in the utility space. Geographic allocation, we're about 60% exposed to US. It's only slightly higher than our benchmark, um, again, our models are showing some of the, that the U.S. is still one of the most attractive regions to invest in. We do have a greater weight in Europe here, uh, because if you were looking for pure play toll roads or airport assets, you have to go generally to Europe. And I think you need a global perspective on an infrastructure space, because for example, if you want to buy a piece of one of the best infrastructure assets in North America, the 407 toll highway, I have to buy it through a Spanish company called Ferrovial. Uh, to get my biggest exposure. So I think that's interesting. I think that's why you need a global approach when you're managing infrastructure and, and real estate assets in general. So the performance of the fund on slide 41. Um, so this goes all the way back to 2011, well before we managed the fund. Again, we brought this in-house in October 2016. Um, you can see why we brought it in-house. It was, it was lagging the index since inception by a significant margin. So we've managed the fund. We're coming up almost on our three-year anniversary. So the performance relative to the benchmark has improved dramatically since we brought it in house. So I think that validates uh, our, our, our approach and our strategy and what we've been doing. So I'm very pleased with the performance of the infrastructure fund since we brought it in house. Slide 42 is the actual chart of our performance since we took it over. Now I wanna explain one little caveat here is our benchmark's that gray line up top. But what we did is we actually changed our benchmark in October 16, right during the, the big correction that we talked about in, sorry, in 2018 during the correction. And so unfortunately it makes us look uh, not as impressive relative to our benchmark because the, the new benchmark significantly outperformed our prior benchmark. Our prior benchmark looks more like our peer class, which is the yellow line. Um, once we've had the portfolio reallocated or rebalanced relative to our new benchmark, you can see that we're once again outperforming quite nicely. So our year to date number has a significant uh, delta to our both our benchmark and our peers, which is, is very pleasing. It turns out that the Q4 2018 period turned out to be a very good buying opportunity uh, for investors in the fund. But I'm pleased to see that you know, our process and our strategies continue to work again once we had everything rebalanced uh, to suit our new benchmark. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think we have some fantastic products in the real asset space, both the Nine Point Global uh, Real Estate Fund and the Nine Point Global Infrastructure Fund. And uh, I'll turn it back to Howard if there are any questions. All righty, thanks, Jeff. I have uh, some questions here. I'll start with the first one. Given the current and projected interest rate environment, what's your outlook for the Global Real Estate Fund? <clears throat> Okay, so I'll make a couple points here on the interest rate environment. Um, falling interest rates or even low and stable rates are generally very positive for the real estate space or for REITs in general. Um, as long as rates aren't collapsing because of an imminent recession, uh, which I certainly don't believe the case, um, the relationship of lower rates and a greater value of a steady cash flow stream implying a higher net asset value holds. Um, so I think it's a very good environment for income producing securities, including REITs and real estate. The second point is that REITs today are trading very close to net asset value, uh, which is basically on average where they should trade. 
Um, but that's because most of the calculations of the net asset value have not included the extremely low uh, interest rates that we're seeing today. So on a spread basis, the REIT dividend yield relative to the U.S. 10 year is actually quite wide. So if that spread narrowed more, we could still see a significant appreciation of, in the real estate space and REITs. So you can see almost a high single digit or double digit increase uh, if we were to believe that rates were going to stay low and around this level for the longer term. And I think that's actually the case given how low interest rates are globally. Okay, another question. No two infrastructure funds in Canada are the same and many are positioned very differently. Can you position your fund versus a couple of competitors? Sure. So as we talked about, I use a total infrastructure approach. I've really broadened the definition of what constitutes infrastructure investments. Uh, we've added many types of businesses that are more relevant in that modern digital economy uh, to the fund. Uh, so I think that really separates us from a lot of our peers who are more benchmark oriented, who have the traditional weight in uh, relative to the benchmark. Um, I won't go into any sort of individual fund of how we're different, but I think the real point to make is that we are very different. We're not benchmark huggers. We've done something different by adding these alternative investments or these these differentiated investments in the infrastructure space that have performed extremely well. I still think we can make the argument that things like cloud computing and defense and data centers and cell phone towers are key parts of uh, infrastructure investments. And so by emphasizing those types of investments, we have been able to do extremely well relative to most of our peers. Okay, a third question. I think you alluded to a bit of this, but uh, pretty much everyone in our business has an opinion about when the next market downturn will happen, possibly caused by the expectation of a recession in the U.S. and Canada. How would a portfolio benefit from real estate and infrastructure assets in a market downturn? Sure. So I think everybody's excited to call the downturn because it happens fast and you make a name for yourself. Um, the expansion has lasted for a very long time. It's been one of the longest expansions on record, but it actually has been, you know, fairly moderate recovery. Um, so as we talked about, I don't think there are signs of an imminent recession coming forward, uh, which makes me more optimistic about the future. The Fed is aggressively easing. You know, it's very good for the income oriented strategies. I think we're going to avoid an economic recession going forward. But, you know, in a recession, the real asset strategies do have a couple of advantages over some of the other business classes or asset classes, right? The steady cash flow through the cycle gives you that cash flow support and the real asset or hard asset protection of both infrastructure and real estate provides some downside support, right? There's a real replacement value of many of these assets. And so even in a downturn and recession scenario, you know, you may see an adjustment, but certainly these assets have been shown to perform extremely well through the cycle. And again, cash flow and hard asset protection is what, what protects you in a real downturn. Okay, uh, finally, a uh, question I would get a lot in meetings is how would you implement your funds into a traditional portfolio of fixed income equities and cash? Okay, so I certainly believe that the Canadian investors over indexed to Canada in general. Um, and certainly what I think I would do is I, I would take a look at where you know, the institutional money managers have allocated their portfolios or how they've allocated those portfolios along the endowment model. And so what we've shown is they've moved almost 50% of their book to the alternative investment classes. And, you know, a weighting of infrastructure and real estate of 20% in the average retail investor's portfolio would not be out of line. Uh, I think that would be a very good guideline of, of where we want uh, the portfolio, or how we want portfolios to look like to take the to, to receive the maximum benefit of the diversification and the low correlation that infrastructure, real estate, uh, the asset classes provide to the overall portfolio. Um, I think that's especially true in a low interest rate environment where fixed income today doesn't provide you with enough income yield in your portfolio uh, given where rates are today. So I think we have to go outside the box to, to find different sources of investment income. I think real estate and infrastructure uh, have a lot of blends and interesting attributes that provide that that support your portfolio. All right, uh, thanks, Jeff. That's all the questions I have. Uh, we want all of you on the line and your clients to benefit from what we've discussed today. We're going to follow up in the coming days with more information and uh, reach out to you to discuss these ideas in more detail. Uh, in the meantime, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Dan if we can help. Have a great afternoon, everyone.